because we have listeners of all different backgrounds, I'm going to start us off really high level. I want to go into the details right away, but we'll start high level. I think most people can understand that buildings use energy, but I don't think many people understand how much demand that buildings actually place on the grid and energy demand. So can you help us understand that a little bit more? And then maybe directionally, do you feel like this demand is just going to get more and more challenging? Yes, well, absolutely. Um, so according to the Department of Energy in the US, there's there's, there's plenty of data um, um, about the energy uh, market. Uh, it's actually 74% of electricity. Okay, it's not just energy. Um, if you look at energy, there's other obviously forms of energy, but we're just looking purely electricity. Uh, it's 74%. And why is it important to focus on electricity? Because we're in the electrification um, era, electrify everything, right? Heating, transportation, etc. And most of the charging, if you talk about EVs, is done in a building. It could be a parking garage, could be your home, could be your office, could be somewhere. There's some in the public space, but it's mostly going to be in buildings. Um, heating will become electric as well, right? So um, that's the goal. The idea is to electrify everything and then make sure that the electricity is generated from clean sources. So today we're at 74%. We're probably going to get much higher than that as this you know, trend continues on electrification. Um, and we have some new loads coming on, like think about data centers and AI and, and what that's going to bring on. So, um, you know, people are talking about building nuclear plants just to supply the um, electricity requirements. And these are also some forms of buildings. So essentially the built environment will account for vast majority of energy consumption. And so, um, you know, obviously kind of uh, <laughs> leading to the next stage is kind of what do we do about that? Like what, what tools are there for buildings to manage that uh, energy usage in the most efficient and, and, and environmental way? Absolutely. And it, from a lot of the research, it sounds like storage, energy storage are, is really one of the solutions. So can, how can the idea of, or the concept of storage and certainly the technology help with this increasing demand? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the need for storage has really become, um, you know, a focus and in, in, in now really a necessity as uh, more and more renewables um, were available and, and the effort to integrate them into the power grid. And, and these resources are variable. They're not steady. Um, and so the way to um, stabilize that energy supply is through storage. So you store when it's available, and then you provide the energy from storage when those resources are not available. I mean, take uh, solar as an example. So you have uh, abundance during the day, you have zero at night, uh, store as much as you can during the day, um, and that will and use the stored energy at night. Um, if we take California, for instance, there's plenty of days in the year today that 100% of the uh, consumption is made from um, solar, even at a, at a, at a surplus. Uh, mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, when you come to the peak hours, which is like between 4 and 9 p.m., uh, the sun is going down, demand is going up, um, you have that daily ramp up phenomena, and then you start to use all the peaker plants, um, all these uh, inefficient gas uh, turbines that just work a few hours a day, and therefore they're least efficient and most polluting, and um, that those those account for, you know, a very significant portion of uh, most of even of the uh, carbon emissions related to electricity production. Uh, storage can help you avoid that. So if you can use the energy during those hours um, instead of using those speaker plants, then you'll be saving a lot of um, uh, carbon and other pollutants uh, released to the atmosphere. So that's uh, that's where storage really comes to the um, to the equation. And uh, uh, tying that to buildings is because you can put storage in two places. You can put this on the front of the grid uh, or, or the meter, or let's say on the grid side, on a, on, a, on a supply side, 
Okay. So you have a generation source. Doesn't matter where what source of it, it could be. It could be a, a, a it could be renewable. It could be in any any type. And that's charging the batteries. And then when you have, um, you know, when you want to use the stored energy, you just run the electrons through the grid, through the through the through the wires. On the other hand, you can have storage on the demand side. And then you have it actually where you need it. So you're now you're not dependent on a grid anymore. You're not dependent on infrastructure. You have the energy on the side of the demand. And mm -hmm. um, that can save you all the infrastructure in the middle. It's much more reliable and resilient, okay? Because you already have it on the side of the demand, not on the side of the supply. And, um, and that's where buildings come into play because that's when 74% of electricity is consumed. So that's where you really want to have that storage uh, in place, and that's why we we believe that buildings have a well, not just we, but uh, I think it's uh, now supported by uh, many other uh, groups and regulators and so on. Uh, that buildings have a key role in uh, the whole energy transition and modernizing the power grid. And storage is, in buildings is is a major component of that. I think two pieces in that for me are a big uh, eye opening moment because I again have worked in the renewable side and. Certainly we're talking about storage, but I think we were mostly talking about storage on the supply side. So I'm less familiar mm -hmm. of, of learning about actually having storage where you need it and having that locally. So I think that's brilliant. And from a storage side, I'll, also I've always associated it probably with your classic battery, or at least that's how I picture it from a storage standpoint. Mm -hmm. But the technology at Nostromo Energy is really different. And I would love for you to share how that is different because I didn't even know necessarily that this existed. So I think our listeners would love to learn more. Sure. Oh, love to. Uh, yeah. So storage is almost synonymous with, with batteries, with lithium batteries. And it just, it's Google energy storage is, this is what you're going to find mostly. And um, because yeah, um, when, when the grid started to, to install, to procure more storage, um, lithium was the technology available still is and but because of the safety issues and we we know what's happening when when a little um scooter goes off in an apartment and you know or you know the the, the dangers of lithium when it catches fire mm -hmm. um so for that most of that went on the supply side it's easier to put a, a battery farm um um outside in the field so we're you know damage is easy contained uh, as opposed to a building in an apartment. Um, and so that's how, and, and so it's easier to scale and build big, big uh, 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 storage um, facilities um, in those uh, outer areas. And that's why all storage right now, not all, but 90 plus percent of storage goes on the front of the meter or the grid side. Uh, okay. uh, buildings don't really want to have those you know, big. If, if you were thinking like a an office building or 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 a, or a hospital or a hotel or any of those, they would need a batteries in the scale of several megawatt hours. Okay, this this is several containers of mm -hmm. of lithium batteries. They don't want to put those things inside a building for obvious reasons, and so that's why they really didn't think that storage is relevant because storage is batteries. Batteries, no, no, no we don't want that. Uh, so. Um, so they're not in the game. So only 1% of storage really goes into the commercial buildings, which are the, the biggest users. So if we talk about 74% of electricity in buildings, 50 to 60% goes into the commercial and industrial and the, and the rest goes to residential. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the safety, the regulatory um, uh, barriers, regulatory in the sense of like fire codes and, and, and those kind of things, which make the installation much more you know, complicated, expensive, et cetera. Um, really kept them out of this um, out of this game, and and you have to think about okay, what are the benefits? Okay, why would a building even have a motivation to install install storage? Why would you play in this in this? This is the part that's the grid's problem, right? I'm a consumer. <laughs> I just want to flip on a switch and get my power. You know, I don't want you know that's your problem, not mine. And and true, a grid is responsible, but um, here becomes a decarbonization factor. Buildings want to be green. Okay, it's good for business. It's good for climate. You know, buildings being rated for their carbon footprint. Um, um, 
uh, in real estate investors raise their capital, it reduces their cost of capital if they're showing the buildings have a, a better um, carbon uh, um, uh, profile. And, and so, and, and storage is probably the most impactful way to reduce the carbon footprint of a building. And, and, and I think that, that goes to the question of when do you consume energy? Because if you consume the energy while, you know, most of it is clean, mm -hmm. you can consume how much you want. I mean, it's like good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. Well, so you got good kilowatts and bad kilowatts. If you go consume them all good kilowatts, nobody's going to care how much. When you consume the bad ones, that's when it's a problem because those are emitting a lot of carbon. So if you can draw electricity during the day when it's clean, uh, first of all, your, your carbon footprint is pretty small, uh, is low, could be even zero. Um, if you can draw more and store that, then during the evening and using, and using that during the evening, that allows you to avoid using the more carbon intensive electricity of the evening and instead use it from your storage. And by that, you can reduce your carbon emissions from the building. And now the building has, has an incentive to do that. Um, the other incentive is that electricity costs are starting to climb rapidly. Part of that because of the energy transition, there's more infrastructure to be placed. Uh, sources are less uh, reliable. Again, that's the nature of renewables. Uh, and, 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 and that brings more costs uh, to, uh, to the uh, power market. And so, and we see that reflecting on the on the prices, on the consumer prices. So, how can you save energy costs with storage? Same thing. If you have a time of use tariff, which is in most most states you have, um, then you can you have peak prices and off peak prices, and you can store your energy during off peak prices and avoid using it during peak prices. You're you're playing this arbitrage, and you're able to reduce your energy costs. So, buildings now are getting a, a big benefit uh, from installing energy storage. Uh, and it's and it's getting more interested. Um, and then comes the question of the technology, okay? Because lithium is, like we said, is 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 a problem from from a safety perspective. Um, and so, looking at safe technologies, and this is the category that we're in, um, thermal energy storage, uh, specifically for cold energy, um, is a completely safe category. We're not the only ones who are doing it, but we have engineered it in a way that every building, almost every building can, can, can install that. Mm -hmm. um, first, let's talk a little about what thermal energy means, and then we can, you know, uh, how do the, uh, the practical um, side of that. So about 50% of the uh, energy in a building goes for thermal conditions, uh, heating and cooling. Uh, we're taking care right now of the cooling side because this is what's using electricity, okay? Heating is still mostly gas. Uh, and cooling uses in big buildings, uh, machines called chillers. Chillers are huge machines, big, big compressors that what they do, they cool water down to like 45 degrees Fahrenheit. That water circulates throughout the building. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of tons of water that circulates in the pipes of the building, goes to every, every space in the building. <coughs> there you have some. Uh, uh, fan coils that blow air over this, those those water coils, and that's that's how you get your air conditioning, and then goes back to the chiller room to be uh, recooled again. That takes about half the electricity that the building is using. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the biggest use of electricity in the building. Um, if you can um, store that energy and provide that instead of using chillers, have a device that stores cold energy and pro and cools that water instead of using a chiller, you can drop the consumption of the building by half when you supply that cold energy from this storage device. And that storage device is what Nostromo is doing. We call it the ice brick, okay? It's called ice brick because we store it in water. Water, um, when it freezes, changes phase from liquid to solid, mm -hmm. um, it stores a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, it's 80 times more energy than the energy you use when you just change the temperature. Uh, it's just the rearrangement of the molecules from a, so <laughs> from a liquid form to a solid form you 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 store 80 uh, kilocalories, whereas just to for per gram of water, whereas if you just change the temperature, it's one kilocalorie, so 80 times more. And we use electricity to freeze that water during off-peak hours or during we have a surplus renewables. Um, so it's in, in a cheap and a clean way. And then when 
you want to use the energy, let's say you're on peak prices or you're uh, 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 high carbon uh, footprint uh, electricity, uh, instead of using the chiller, you just use those ice, uh, cold energy in the ice, and, and use that to cool the water of the building instead of using electricity. Uh, sounds like very simple, but the engineering is a little more complicated. You want to do this very efficiently. You want to do this in a compact way. How do you install this in the building? There's a lot of practical uh, uh, challenges in, in doing this, and that's where our technology has been um, pretty pretty successful in 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 engineering uh, this concept in a way that every building can be uh, um, can can have it. So well, I appreciate you answer. distilling it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I appreciate you distilling it to that level. And I know you're saying it sounds overly simple, but I think that's what's needed is that level of description for everybody to understand. And I work with. Uh, department of engineers and i know it's never that simple so i appreciate you distilling it to that level and this might be a dumb question but is the water that you have in your technology is that something that you're constantly sourcing that there's a faucet on and this water is coming in or do you single source it when you install it it is the one time that it's there and i'm really asking the question i'm thinking of our a facility that i was talking to recently they have a more classic storage but they're in a very water strapped area and so I'm wondering what that looks like from a water sourcing standpoint. Right. No, it's a, it's a closed system. So you fill it once and those cells are good for, you know, 25, 30 years. And once you replace them, you can water your plants. It's like uh, <laughs> we just, nothing, no, nothing goes away, nothing spent. There's no water waste uh, at all. Very interesting. And the next time I see my ice cubes melting, I'm going to think about all the energy that's being produced there. <laughs> And yeah, it is. We're I mean, talking... if you take it out of the <laughs> freezer, it doesn't freeze right away, right? It can sit there for yeah. 10 minutes maybe, and it yeah. slowly, slowly freezes. That's when it's really absorbing the energy from the outside and cools the environment. Obviously, mm. it's a small ice cube, and then that it's a bit difficult to 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 understand that. But uh, um, uh, in the way that uh, it, it works uh, in a building is that um, we, we store, I mean, we have these this device is called ice bricks and inside each one of them, there's hundreds of small capsules that contain water. Just, it's a regular tap water, but we add some ingredients to the water to accelerate the freezing. So it freezes very efficiently, mm -hmm. just using less energy. Uh, there's this concept of round trip efficiency in energy storage. So what is your losses? I mean, you don't make energy when you store it, right? You lose. So if you have uh, a, like a 90% round trip efficiency, you mean your losses are 10%. And that's, mm -hmm. That's kind of the high end of the range, and that's where we are. We're we're at ninety percent, sometimes even a little more than that, um, on the round trip efficiency. And uh, those capsules with the water, uh, there's a coolant that flows between those uh, capsules, and the coolant kind of uh, extracts the cold energy from the capsules as the ice melts. And then there's a heat transfer, uh, uh, sorry, a heat exchanger, which is like a big radiator that you have the water from the building coming in are cooling coming from the other side, they exchange that temperature and the water is cooled and it goes into the building back uh, without having to operate the chillers. 